So could you please uh, start the uh, screen share? Packet filter programs, trace points. 
So you now have the capability with F-Trace uh, or with K-Probes to be able to um, have arbitrary code uh, run in the kernel uh, to gather additional data, to perform uh, aggregation, or do histograms. And speaking of histograms, uh, F-Trace added an actual histogram feature uh, so that instead of uh, accumulating the events into the trace buffer, uh, you can tell the traces to accumulate the events rather into some buckets and then give the results out to get a SysFS interface. So you can do all this just manipulating the uh, debug. Well, they're not no longer in uh, its trace file system. It used to be in the debug file system, but uh, just using uh, from the from a shell command line, you can actually cause F trace to produce histograms. You can look at the text histograms that are produced. Uh, so that's actually really handy uh, for looking at things in the embedded system. In Linux 4.8, uh, we have uh, a new kernel documentation system. The main reason for commenting on this is that now uh, there will be some benefits for uh, developers as you use this system, but also as you write new documentation for the kernel, it's based on uh, Sphinx, uh, which uses something called RE structured uh, uh, RE structured text. Sorry, it's a uh, different Markdown language. It's similar to a lot of other Markdown languages like uh, uh, Wiki or Markdown or uh, any number of other uh, languages out there. They're kind of simplified. They're intended to be uh, have the be produced as ASCII text and then can be translated into multiple output formats uh, on the back side. So you can produce HTML documentation or PDFs or um, other formats. Um, also, in, so that's, that's actually uh, pretty useful. There's, there's been some complaints about the documentation system for quite a long time. It was originally in DocBook and it was in uh, LitTech. And so this is kind of a difficult system to use. This is a little bit easier. Uh, there's a new pseudo-random number generator uh, that went into this release uh, for people interested in security. That's important. Um, in terms of ARM64, there's now support for KExec and KProbes. Another thing that happened in uh, Linux 4.8 was the new timer wheel implementation. Uh, and this is really interesting to me. I actually studied the timer wheel. This is one of the first things I studied when I got into Linux many, many years ago. And the timer wheel has has been there for uh, a long, long time, probably at least 20 years. Um, and it was the way that the kernel, uh, it was the data structure inside the kernel that was used to process uh, timers. Um, but and it did an admirable job for many, many years, but the, even, even 20 years later, you can find um, aspects of it that could be improved. And so uh, they did, uh, Thomas Leichner, uh, produced a new timer wheel implementation. It actually has better performance uh, than the old one, which was, which was really hard to beat. Um, uh, it does not, the main thing, though, is that it does not do something called the cascade operation. As you shift it from one uh, time quantum to the next, uh, you would have to coalesce a bunch of timers and move them into uh, other buckets in the old wheel implementation. And this uh, does not require that anymore. Uh, it, it just the nature of the data structure uh, means that it automatically coalesces longer timeouts and gives those uh, that has the effect of giving them reduced resolution, but that usually doesn't matter uh, because uh, if you're doing something that's you know five minutes out or ten minutes out, you really don't need you don't need that precision down to microseconds. Um, and so it's a, there's a trade-off in the in the resolution, but it's a, a really good one in terms of uh, speeding up the overall processing. And uh, the reason I include this is uh, it's just really interesting that uh, uh, even some very basic uh, structures and implementations in the kernel can uh, end up being improved upon as we as we realize uh, you know over time the requirements change. Uh, the big thing here being that uh, real time is important and power management is important. And co coalescing those timers has always been something that's required a bunch of uh, extra code, uh, which takes extra power. So um, let's see. In Linux 4.9, we have virtually mapped kernel stacks. Uh, this allows us to detect um, 
stack overruns. Uh, this is a, a, a very uh, interesting feature. If you've worked with kernel stacks before, you know that they've always been uh, in physical memory, and uh, there's been uh, there's always been kind of dangerous <laughs> because they can overrun and they just run into whatever the kernel memory is next, and there were no guards or anything. And now uh, that they're uh, being managed by the memory manager uh, in virtual memory, uh, you can do a lot of uh, a, a lot more um, well management, uh, and you can detect things like when the, the stack pointer runs off the page. Um, the great thing about this is not only uh, did it provide these extra security features, but it cleaned up the kernel code and it ended up in pro faster process creation. Uh, this is only available on x86 for now, but I believe that people are looking at doing a similar thing on ARM, um, and so we may see uh, that coming out uh, sometime soon. Another thing in 4.9 was Graybus, uh, which was a bus that was developed for the ARA project uh, by Google with a modular phone, that uh, bus got uh, integrated during the, the software for that type of hardware bus was integrated into the kernel. Um, and so the project ARA is not, uh, I think it's been canceled by Google, Google but a lot of the uh, ideas and the issues that were raised by that modular phone architecture uh, are now supported by the kernel, or at least there's preliminary support. So uh, that will be okay. There's time samples for EDTF, uh, which means the Berkeley packet filter can do it has a lot more flexibility for, for doing tracing and things like that. And also in Linux 4.9, mod versions were deprecated. So uh, mod versions was an aspect of the kernel that uh, allowed you to specify uh, kind of like a signature on the function calls uh, that for the symbols that were in a particular module. And uh, it was used to detect uh, incompatibility between uh, kind of third-party modules that were developed out of tree and the kernel. And it was determined that there was a lot of complexity there and a lot of overhead. Uh, and so they were just removed. Uh, the whole mod version system was removed. Uh, so that's something to pay attention to. You now have to be uh, a lot more careful if you have out of tree binary modules uh, that they are only used with kernels they were actually uh, compiled for. Um, in 4.10, a uh, whole bunch of things, uh, first sketch, time hist, uh, so histograms, time histograms for schedulers, I was added, that support was added to the perf command. Perf is a very, very powerful command that can do all kinds of, uh, kinds of uh, tracing and performance uh, counter related uh, activities. Perf originally uh, was created and stands for performance counter tool or something like that. It originally was just a tool to grab performance counters and show you uh, those over time. But it's now developed into uh, quite a handy tool for measuring all kinds of uh, things in the kernel. Um, uh, there's now something in the kernel called hybrid block polling, uh, changing the way uh, that block I.O. is pulled for. Uh, it's actually kind of simple in concept that uh, the block I.O. Uh, in cases where the kernel used to just continuously pull, uh, it now can go to sleep for a short period. And the, the tricky part is uh, how long is that short period? There's a short delay. It's estimated uh, that the kernel uses before the polling starts. That means that the kernel can go off instead of in a pure, purely polling situation. It can actually go off, do some other work, and then come back and hopefully start the polling right before the uh, I.O. interrupt arrives. Um, or right, it's not interrupt in this case, right before the I.O. arrives. And so it can detect it uh, without any loss of uh, performance. So you still get the same benefit uh, of queuing the blocks with the same performance as pure polling. Uh, but it actually uses less CPU life to go through some other tasks. So that's actually a very nice addition to the block I.O. layer. Uh, in this release, there was a lot of support for ARM SOCs. Uh, a lot of code went in for Huawei, Allwinner, Marvel, Linux. A uh, lot of, uh, and that's that's continuing to develop. A lot of uh, a lot of chip vendors are getting their uh, code upstream. There's still a long ways to go for some for some SOCs, but it, they're making progress. 
Uh, POSIX timers is uh, one of the features of the kernel. It's now configurable, so you can remove them if you don't have to be using them in your embedded system. I'll talk more about some of the size things that are now configurable uh, later. Uh, the init RAMFS compression method is selectable, so you can use different compression. You can make the trade-off between uh, how compact the image is versus how long it takes to decompress. Uh, so you can, there's more uh, flexibility there. Uh, and there's also a new interface for sleep, system sleep state selection. I'll talk about that later when I get to power management. Uh, and then uh, UBIFS, which is one of the uh, file systems uh, used in very low end uh, or low end embedded devices, that gains support for encryption. Uh, if we're on 11, and I apologize, I'm going through this so quickly, uh, but. A lot of these I'll kind of come back to when I get to uh, the different categories of, uh, of technical areas. Uh, but in Linux 4.11, there was a new kernel ref count API, uh, so that's something to uh, pay attention to. Uh, that's important for people who are writing drivers, uh, doing reference counting in their driver. You need to uh, look at the API differences there. Uh, tiny DRM system was added, uh, and I'll talk again about that later. There's a new static system call. So uh, there, the stat system call has been around since the very first Unix, and is one of the very first system calls, one of the most important system calls for getting information about a file system object. Um, and uh, it's actually, there's a new system call that is intended to replace it. Of course, it'll take a long time for programs to adapt to it and use it, but uh, it has a couple of really important features. One is that it provides 2038 <coughs> safe calls. So any, any calls to static will give you time values that, uh, have, that will not break in 2038. Uh, and then the other thing is that uh, it's been optimized for efficiency. The old stat call uh, would give you uh, all of the stat information from that, from that syscall. Uh, and this new one allows you to request only certain pieces of information. So there's some, there's some pieces of information in the stat call that are kind of expensive to calculate uh, or to return. And uh, if you don't need those, you can, uh, you can use the statx call and ask only for the cheaper ones. And this actually uh, will help programs be more efficient uh, working with the kernel. Um, and then a uh, big thing in Portal 11 was uh, the re refactoring of uh, one of the include files, sketch.h. Uh, so the Linux path structure has been refactored, and some parts of it were moved into moved around. So you have to be really, really careful here. A lot of code and modules that were built before this will have the old structures. Uh, and uh, if you don't have your code in mainline, you need to make sure that it gets recompiled uh, this is one of those things that uh, an ABI change, uh, and so uh, binary modules will have a problem with this. You need to make sure that you're using the new structures uh, uh, going forward after 4.11. Uh, in 4.12, uh, there were some new block I.O. schedulers, uh, and I would be hard pressed to tell you uh, exactly uh, what the new, there's always kind of new experimental stuff going on. I, uh, I'm not, I don't remember what uh, the big deal was with these, but uh, I think that they're there for uh, solid state drives. Uh, there's been a lot of work uh, to help improve the performance of solid state drives, make the I.O. scheduler not the, uh, not the bottleneck for that. Uh, there was a mini, mini TTY prep work uh, not a full mini TTY implementation yet, and I'll talk about that uh, when I get to system size. This is a, uh, an effort to reduce the size of the TTY driver for embedded systems. Uh, so very exciting work, but it did hit some, some problems getting, uh, getting uh, mainline. Uh, there's proper support for USB Type-C connectors, and then a, a new analyzed boot tool uh, coming out of uh, Intel Power Management Graph Tool project. Uh, this is a new tool, uh, a little bit similar to, um, oh, what was the name of the old tool that we had, boot chart. Uh, reads the message and possibly the F trace log and produces an HTML graph of boot events. Uh, boot chart uh, read the message and, uh, and produced a PNG. 
Uh, but anyway, you can go look at this. It's really handy. If you're working on boot time reduction, uh, this is a really useful tool to see um, how long things are taking during the boot. Um, and then finally, 4.13, although it's not released yet, we're on RC7, so very, very unlikely that anything uh, big is going to change between now and Sunday. Um, a couple of things that are interesting, the, there's a new TLS implementation in the kernel. Uh, so uh, it, for certain things like HTTPS performance, where you know, H TLS is kind of the encryption layer for HTTP, uh, and having that code in kernel should help with performance. Uh, there's some other technical reasons uh, having to do with uh, net filtering, uh, why it's uh, useful to have this uh, inside the kernel. Um, so the kernel can unpack some of the fields and, and do the net filtering properly. Uh, but anyway, if you're interested at all in that, make sure you go look at this uh, LWN.net article. A couple other things interesting, the next interrupt prediction. So uh, there's uh, a new system in the kernel uh, that tries to make a better prediction of when the next interrupt will occur. And this is, this is a very difficult problem, but if you can get it right, if you can predict correctly, you can go into a, a lower sleep state and save a lot more power. Um, and so uh, that's something that is now in there. It saves up to four values of the last time, uh, kind of the interval between interrupts for the last four interrupts from each device in the system. And then tries to make a prediction based on all of the devices in the system when the next mobile interrupt is going to occur. Um, and then uh, F2FS support. Uh, so people are still using uh, the, flash, uh, the flash to file system. Uh, that has support for disk quotas, so uh, that is to continue to be maintained, and some people are using that in devices. Uh, it's got some benefits over EXP4 for some, some products. And then uh, K-Self-Test is transitioning to the TAP13 protocol, and I'll, I'll come back to that and tell you what TAP is when I get to testing. Okay, so uh, technology areas. Uh, so let's go through these kind of, some of the same things, but uh, now uh, I'm going to talk about them in topic areas. So the Analyze Boot Tool, that's one of the most important things that's new uh, in, in the 4.12 release. Sorry, there's a typo there. Um, there's uh, not been a whole lot of reduction, but there are, new, there are tools for redu reducing things. And there's lots of uh, talks about how to improve things. There'll be another one at ELC Europe, a talk on uh, boot time reduction techniques. <laughs> Uh, but here's a couple of talks. Uh, there, some of these are old. The LCE 2014, 12 Lessons Learned in Boot Time Reduction. Uh, one by Andrew Murray, John Mahaffey, and one just recently on improving the boot up time of, uh, of the end. <laughs> by Bernard Rosenkranz. And so some of the ideas that Bernard presented, obviously a lot of them were very specific to Android, but the same types of things can be applied to other, uh, other projects or a project based on other um, distributions. I, I, from my perspective, I consider an Android a distribution on top of Linux. But um, uh, basically, there are kind of two approaches. This is always true, uh, whether you're doing Android or something else. You can, you can work to improve the cold boot time, or you can work to enhance the spend resume time. Uh, most phones actually don't go through a cold boot you know, when you press the off button. They just go into a hibernate mode or a suspend mode. Um, uh, but there's values for both of these. Uh, the areas that Bernard looked at uh, were, um, he looked at uh, in Android, the package manager scanning. There's a big scan of all the packages and the system boots on Android. Looked at Java, Java class preloaded, preloading. Uh, one really simple thing he did was to force the CPU frequency high during boot uh, so that you're running as fast as possible. You don't let the governors or any kind of automatic uh, frequency governor uh, slow your system down. That will get you through your boot time faster. And then you can, after boot is finished, you can, you can let the governor take over and, and reduce speed or power. Uh, there's things like I.O. So the, the amount of I.O. During, done, done during boot is usually very, very high, so there's a whole bunch of techniques using uh, read-ahead, uh, kernel compression, uh, compression of the kernel image itself, so that's, that's during the boot loader phase, and then squash FS doing uh, compressed I.O., uh, compressed files 
actually during runtime. Um, so there's a lot of ways you can reduce the I.O. Uh, he also did something with kernel modules, deferring the module load until later. That's kind of an old technique, but it still has to be done kind of on a per-product basis. Um, and then there's library and compiler optimization. So if you're interested, so a lot of these are not unique to Android. The last, uh, the last four, in fact, are uh, pretty generic and could be useful for anyone who's working on, on boot up time. Uh, device tree. Uh, is a section of the kernel it has to do with uh, specifying how uh, the firmware describes the hardware to the kernel. The, the kind of three big areas of work in this, uh, besides just people submitting new device tree configuration files, DTS files, uh, there, there's been work on some, a feature called device tree overlays. Um, and actually, it's, I now kind of wonder if this will get mainlined because it's been going on for over a year now, I think about two years. Is, uh, but this is a feature that allows plug-in boards to be configured at runtime. So there's a lot of boards in the uh, in Embedded uh, that have uh, the capability to apply daughter boards. And so there's a bunch of new hardware that shows up or that's available on, on those uh, boards those daughter boards that you have to describe to the kernel, and you don't want to have to rebuild your kernel every time you swap your daughter board. So uh, there's a way for the uh, device tree overlays is a way for uh, the um, firmware, the bootloader, uh, to detect uh, daughter board and change the device tree at boot time. Uh, and so hopefully that will get in. I know people are doing some workaround. There's patches that are out of tree that are being used on various boards like uh, Redford Pi or uh, the Beagle board, Beagle Bone. Um, there's device tree val validation. So this work uh, started about a year ago and then got completely stalled. However, however, uh, there was a new proposal just recently. Uh, by Pantelis. Pantelis is one of the guys who uh, does some of these uh, uh, projects, uh, experimental projects in, in with device tree. Uh, he has a new proposal for, for converting the device tree to YAML format. So it did, the maintainers were not very excited about this, but he did raise uh, some of the issues, including validating the device tree, which he thought uh, he, he argued that that would be easier if you had it in a format that uh, that had an external parser instead of a custom parser. The current current parser in there, there's a special compiler for the device tree language. Uh, he said we should use a generic generic uh, language uh, that's supported in the industry, which is what YAML is. Uh, and then there's been talk about uh, doing an updated device tree specification. Uh, and uh, the old device tree specification is quite old uh, and uh, not, um, well, it could use a lot of improvement. Anyway, a lot of this stuff was talked about uh, actually almost a year ago in 2016, although there will be, uh, there was a BOF at ELC uh, 2017, and there'll be another device tree BOF coming at, at ELC Europe in October. Uh, so we'll probably hear updates on the status of these uh, things going on with device tree. In terms of graphics, I, I mentioned TinyDRM, uh, which was uh, integrated, I think, in 4.12. Um, so this is actually really neat, I think. Uh, this is a, specifically for the in, uh, embedded. It uh, provides graphic support for small and very simple displays. So these are displays that uh, usually things like LCD displays, uh, but they could be kind of low resolution, um, you know, Displays anyway. This displays oh, that are uh, specifically the data is driven over IPC or SPI. The idea is that uh, uh, with this you could use the same DRM APIs, uh, replace the frame buffer drivers over time, uh, and get the benefits of, of having the same API as kind of bigger displays, but still but still uh, be suitable for uh, these smaller simple displays. And uh, you can see. You can go look at the patches and, and see what that's about there. Also, uh, there's been a lot of work on uh, uh, supporting a new uh, alternative to OpenGL ES uh, as a higher level API, uh, and that is uh, called Vulkan. So there's a talk on Vulkan at ELC 
talks about the differences between it and OpenGL ES. And it's, it's basically some optimization uh, in the graphics area uh, for uh, embedded type things. I think it's used in non-embedded as well, but it's, a, it's basically it's an evolution of uh, the API for, for graphics, during graphics. Um, in terms of GPO, GPU drivers, this is a this is a topic that is uh, that often comes up. Uh, the, there, this is the basic state. So there's a problem, there's these basically there's these big six. These are the six biggest uh, GPU uh, families out in the industry, and the Vodcom. And there's actually really good support for uh, drivers for those in the form of the Nouveau, the Enaviv, and the Video 4.4 driver uh, for Linux. So those have open drivers. Uh, the, for the Qualcomm Adreno, which is obviously used in off, an awful lot of cell phones, um, and the, there's a driver that's the free Adreno driver. That is actually continuing to be developed. It's under active development. Uh, there was just a new release of it done in June. Uh, and you can go actually look at uh, the, this article that I've got linked to here as a uh, um, uh, there's a blog entry that talks about all the features that are now supported with the, the latest driver. Uh, the two that are outstanding that kind of uh, are problematical are the Imagination Power VR. Uh, there's no public driver for that one or no open source driver. Although they talked about it in 2015, but it never came about. And uh, some news in the last couple months is Apple is uh, dropping its uh, Imagination support, so they're not using the Imagination IP. I don't know if they're what they're using is actually Power VR. I suspect it's a, if not Power VR, it's a close cousin. Uh, so that's actually a little bit uh, concerning. Uh, the other one is the ARM Molly, uh, which is used in uh, a number of chips, including some MediaTek processors and All Winner and some others. Uh, I think anyway. Um, so there was some work. There was a project called. About two years ago, but, uh, there has not been a lot of work on that, and uh, there's no open source drivers likely. ARM is the owner of this one. This is the one that they kind of ship as the uh, well, the default if people want to license it from them. Uh, and they said that they do not plan to produce an open source driver, so that's disappointing. Um, <clears throat> in terms of file system. Uh, we had UPIFS support for encryption. Uh, there's been a lot of I/O scheduling work done for solid-state storage, so well, that's really good. So making even EXT4 file systems uh, much, much better for uh, storage that is not rotating media. Um, and then uh, something called Light NVM, which is the software control of the flash translation layer. I won't go into the details here, but basically, um, more and more uh, the the, more and more of the storage in our uh, embedded devices is, is on flash, and a lot of times it's on flash that is like a black box that we do not have control over the flash translation layer. So there's some new APIs uh, in the flash management, um, well, the interface between the kernel and the hardware. Uh, there's some new devices coming out that have an API you to transfer control of that flash translation layer over to the software, which is really handy for Linux. So Linux can then use its knowledge of the file system pattern uh, to do a better job of managing uh, that layer. Uh, so that's actually uh, really interesting and useful. Should ultimately, that should result in better performance for flash-based file systems uh, in the future. And then just a little uh, note here, F2FS has support for disk quotas. So UBIFS, F2FS, uh, they don't get a whole lot of attention in the mainstream press, but they continue to be uh, worked on and supported. And, and so if you need them for your embedded project, they're available and uh, they're fairly mature. Uh, networking, the big news here is just Bluetooth. Uh, you know, there's Wi-Fi drivers uh, and things, but Bluetooth 5, uh, has been released. Uh, it has about an 800% data throughput increase. It's all supported in the kernel, four, time, four times the range, and uh, better coexistence with wireless. So um, don't have a lot of, uh, these are mostly uh, hardware kind of specs, but uh, this is all supported in the kernel and, and working well, at least in the later 
um, uh, the later uh, versions of kernels. In terms of power management, a couple of things. Uh, uh, there's a new interface for system sleep state in 4.10. So there's now something called sys power mem sleep. And uh, um, I can't remember what's different about this one. Uh, you'll have to do a Google on this one. If you if you do stuff like manipulating the sleep state, uh, you want to you want to Google this and see what the difference, uh, well, how this differs from the old interface. Um, sorry, kind of drawing a blank on that one. The next one is power efficient work use. This is very very recent. This just went into uh, I think 4.13, um, and this is more efficient work scheduling. So work queues is really the uh, the most important, well, it's, it's one of the critical uh, tech, uh, subsystems or I, I don't know what you call it, facilities in the kernel for scheduling work asynchronously. This is probably how 95% of work is scheduled asynchronously inside the kernel. Um, and there's been some new work to produce a new version of, work, of the work queues uh, that has power efficient uh, that is power aware. Uh, and the basic idea here is that uh, the old work queues or the kind of the normal regular work queues, uh, when they wake up, they'll usually wake up on the uh, same CPU that they were scheduled on. Uh, these new ones uh, try to do a better job of, of putting, the, putting the wake up onto an, uh, a CPU that's either already running or uh, that is low power, there's some other things. Initial results from this uh, is that uh, using these uh, power efficient work queues, at least under one workload that a developer uh, had on the LKML, uh, showed about a 15% better energy consumption. So this is a really big deal. Um, uh, yeah, you don't see 15% jumps in the performance of anything very often. So uh, this is something that you want to look at if you've got your own drivers, you want to make sure that you're using power efficient work queues uh, for scheduling uh, scheduling work uh, for that driver. Uh, and then finally, there's a whole bunch of topics related to power management. Uh, the first, For the first time ever, there was uh, something called the Operating System Directed Power Management Summit. This was held, uh, I think, in April. Uh, and I can't go into all the topics they talked about, but there's a whole lot of information that was uh, uh, discussed at this summit, things like energy-aware scheduling, uh, and uh, all kinds of stuff that uh, will make your head spin. <laughs> but if you're into scheduling and you're into power management, this is definitely material that you want to go look at. These, these are the types of things that are being put into the Linux kernel right now uh, to, to make, uh, make it better at power management. Um, so uh, then, moving on to real time. So, Real time, kind of one of the big things is sched deadline. It, that's been in the kernel for quite a long time, uh, but it continues to evolve. Uh, it's got energy aware scheduler support. Uh, it's got a new feature called bandwidth reclaiming, uh, which temporarily allows tasks that see its bandwidth. Uh, so, it's kind of, it, it, it doesn't, uh, it allows a process basically to cheat on. Uh, uh, the sketch deadline says, well, I'm going to finish by this time, and, and you're guaranteed to do that. And it's like, well, if you don't quite finish, you can, you can ask for a little bit more time, and if no other process is going to get hurt by that, then you're actually granted it. Uh, there's support for frequency scaling and group scheduling, because uh, sketch deadline is really important for um, uh, real-time systems. Uh, and then uh, at ELC, there was um, a, a lot of talks uh, well, a few talks on effectively measuring or reducing kernel latencies, uh, real-time Linux on embedded multi-core processors, uh, and there was a whole real-time summit actually in, at ELC as a parallel uh, parallel conference, uh, and there will be again at ELC Europe. Uh, there'll be a real-time Linux summit. Uh, so the work continues here. A lot of work for um, there'll be actually I believe a status talk on the on where we are with uh, RT Preem and uh, how well it's going to the mainline. In terms of security, the big news is uh, this big kernel hardening project. This is basically um, a whole bunch of people that uh, one of the primary ones is a guy by the name of uh, Keys Cook. 
Um, and uh, he has been uh, taking a lot of patches that have been out of treat for a long time that are in basically a secure Linux project and adding them to Linux. Uh, kind of going one by one and, and closing down uh, a lot of these uh, security vulnerabilities in the, in the kernel. This is just, uh, I, there's four of them listed here, but but these are, this is just a small sampling. Uh, he's probably done at least 10 in the last year, 10 patch sets uh, that do kind of that plug various interesting vulnerabilities in the, in the kernel. There were a couple I was reading about this data that I didn't get onto the slide. Um, but uh, there's something, the rare write infrastructure. Uh, so there's portions of the kernel memory that are sensitive that you can keep read only most of the time. So uh, it's very, it's much more difficult for an attacker to write into uh, that, that memory and cause a vulnerability. And then these other three, uh, they're listed here, are GCC plugins for kernel security. So they're actually involving the compiler in protecting the kernel. Uh, current exec, which prevents kernel from executing user space code. Struct link, uh, which zeroes out some of the kernel structures that are passed to user space, so there's no information leaks. Um, and you can see articles on those two. And another one for randomizing the C structure layout. So when you move stuff around randomly, every every build of the kernel gets kind of a different layout of particular structures. Makes it very, very difficult for uh, uh, attack code uh, to find uh, the, the it, it makes it so you can't run the same type of attack on everybody's kernel, and so it really reduces, it makes it more difficult for, for people to break the kernel. Um, and there was a, a good presentation at uh, PLC 2017 on Linux and PPM systems. Uh, there'll be some more presentations on different security aspects uh, at uh, ELC Europe, uh, and so Looking forward to more work there. And, uh, and as, as I said, uh, there's more, as part of this hardening project, kernel hardening, uh, there's a lot more uh, patches that have been uh, going in. And if you're interested in that, if you follow, you just go to lwm.net and look at some of the things that have been done recently. System size. Uh, so the init manifest compression method is selectable. I talked about that already. Uh, Nicholas Petrie, who, who works for Lenaro, has been doing uh, a lot of this size work. He did the configurable posit timers, so now you can choose whether or not uh, to put those in. Uh, surprisingly, the kernel has like, I don't know, 13 or 14,000 configuration options, and there was not one, there was not a configuration option for posit timers. So uh, some embedded systems do not use those, do not need those, and so it's nice to be able to figure them off. Um, and then mini TPY, he actually did a smaller implementation of the TPY subsystem. Uh, and uh, this, this, is, this one was quite controversial. It saves about 38K because the TPY system in Linux is, is very, very old. Uh, it, it has a lot of stuff in there that actually a lot of embedded systems aren't using at all. Most of, most of the time in embedded, the only thing that's using the TPY is the serial console. Well, the shell, but... Um, but a lot of the features, legacy features of PQI, are just not used at all. Uh, and so Nicholas went and he did a bunch of work to refactor. Uh, well, he basically wrote it from scratch, and that's news following the limitation. People wanted him to go and just, well, can't you just make the old one configurable? And he said, no, that's not really feasible. Uh, by the time you're done cutting it up, um, it, it, would be, it would be bigger uh, for the default case, and not not as small as this one. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see if this gets in. Portions of it got in, uh, but not some of the actual main savings. So we'll see what happens. The other thing uh, that uh, uh, Nicholas worked on was shrinking the scheduler. And this is really controversial. Uh, so this drops dropped a bunch of features and eliminated real-time and dead deadline scheduler classes, uh, saved about 20k. Uh, and uh, Ingo Molnar, who's the maintainer of the scheduler, just did not like this at all. He said, this is good. This makes the, the code much more complex. And, it, and for him, it's not worth saving 20k. Uh, and there's a big disagreement online on the mainline mailing list whether or not Linux should even be supporting, you know, are we, is it worth it to go after 20k of code? Uh, 
And uh, the embedded people say yes. The non-embedded people are like, well, I don't want to maintain it. And so this is this is right in the area of uh, things that are kind of difficult to get mainline. Uh, but the patches are out there, uh, so we'll see what happens. Uh, there are there were some good side presentations. Uh, Marcel Holtman was they actually able to get Linux running in about one megabyte. Uh, for an IoT sensor project they was doing. So that was very impressive. Um, and uh, if you want to see how he, he did that, you can go look at that uh, presentation. Uh, but then also at ELC, there was a, a Birds of a Feather session by multiple Openacker uh, talking about uh, different techniques for reducing the size. Okay, now on to testing. So. Uh, this is just a list of various uh, systems that are out there, K-Self-Test, Fuego, Kernel CI, and Lava, and I'll go over each of those real quickly. K-Self-Test is the unit test framework that is inside the uh, Linux source tree, kernel source tree. Uh, so it's very, it's just got started like a couple of years ago. Uh, so um, the recent work, it, so it does, it's not doing a full regression unit test of the entire kernel. Uh, each system is kind of adding things at their own rate. Some systems there's no tests. Some systems there's a couple of tests. Uh, recently, there's lots more regression tests added. Um, and so whenever there's a syscall compatibility, there's a regression uh, that we find in the kernel. Uh, a lot of times, someone will write a test, to make sure that that, doesn't, that regression doesn't occur again. So when a fix happens for a regression, people are supposed to put a test in uh, to make sure that that case doesn't happen again. Um, and it's slowly happening. So I think this is still going to take many years to produce uh, usable code. But it's now getting to the point where some of the first kernels that had a self-test are working their way through kind of the industry pipeline. And uh, we'll be starting to see those in products. And so you may, if you haven't, you should go look at a self-test and see if running these uh, is useful for uh, part of your quality assurance. The other thing that happened is uh, we had some discussions actually in Japan uh, about converting uh, the K-Self test uh, into the test anything protocol uh, as the output, standard output format. And uh, so they'll be discussing this at the kernel summit, but work is already underway to do that. So instead of just a, instead of any format at all, uh, the preferred format, output format for the test is test anything protocol. And then test anything protocol uh, that is just a specification for the, the, the log format. And then there are existing tools that can take that and do things like uh, analyze it, do visualization. There's a Jenkins plugin for, for TAP, uh, so you can see the result. So that is actually really uh, really useful, I think. Um, Fuego. So Fuego is the test framework that I'm working on. Uh, and it's, it, I should take off that new. It's not that new anymore. Uh, but it's a framework for collaborating on test and test infrastructure. Uh, the 1.1 release happened in April. Um, we did a, a bunch of stuff there. Um, if you're not using Fuego, none of this stuff makes much sense. But uh, but if you are, this is, this is pretty pretty good stuff. We upgraded to the latest Jenkins. We refactored the way the test scripts are handled. That involved the Fuego uh, container directory, a change in that layout, which was kind of a painful thing. Uh, but we're uh, very excited about the new 1.2 release. We've been working since April on the 1.2 release. Uh, it's not out yet, um, but uh, this one has um, a new unified output format. So every test uh, produces its test results in the same format. Uh, and it's in JSON, uh, which means it's really easy to uh, send around and uh, actually to view as well in the human in JSON. And it's in a format that's compatible with kernel CI. We worked a little, little bit with kernel CI guys um, and uh, discussed the fields they were using. And so it's very similar to what kernel CI has. It's not identical, but I think it's actually, it's actually compatible. I think kernel CI would process it. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so that, there's a whole bunch of benefits to that new. We just barely got this unified output format in place. There's a whole bunch of benefits to that that we will see as we start using it. Uh, there's a new report generation system that we're working on. Uh, there's new visualization, uh, new plotting tools that we're working on uh, that use that format. But uh, right now we're just 
in the foreign matter place and, and implementing all the parsers for the existing test to, to produce that one. Another thing that we did uh, in 1.2 is the new pass criteria. So this is a way to indicate, um, well, let me see, it's hard, kind of hard to describe, but when you have a, like a big test like LTP, uh, sometimes tests fail and you don't care. Uh, and uh, up until now, there's been no way to kind of specify that in a formal fashion. Uh, and things can fail for a variety of reasons that are unimportant to the actual outcome. They can fail because a kernel config is missing or because of, there's something unique about someone's uh, board setup. Uh, but now we have an actual language JSON file uh, that, that tells the system uh, what the pass criteria is, what tests can be safely ignored, what tests are required to pass. Uh, again, this is all part of the philosophy of Fuego that we be able to share these things between users. So people always had to develop uh, their list of tests that they wanted to ignore, but they always did it manually and they just put them in a document somewhere. There's no way to share that and actually have it usable by some other, some other tester. Uh, so we're kind of excited about that. And then there's, there actually is a new test dependency system and a way to create more dynamic variables. And I, I won't go into that. I've already talked too much about Fuego. It's kind of self-serving. Um, kernelci.org is doing very, very well. It's a place to get free build and boot testing for your boards. Um, uh, there are, I think, about 10 labs right now that are doing testing. Uh, you can send a board to uh, to one of those labs, uh, and you'll get free testing continuously on the upstream kernel. Um, if you want to learn more about that, there's been lots of articles, and, and well, not articles, but there's been a lot of talks on that. Um, and I consider it to be the most successful public distributed build and test system for Linux in the world. And all of those qualifiers are important. There's a lot of people doing private testing of Linux, uh, but this is kind of the most successful public one uh, that's distributed, uh, which I think is uh, really key for scalability. Uh, and then Lava. Lava had a V2 release in the last year. Uh, Lava is Lenaro's automation and validation architecture. Uh, some of the things they came out with in V2, they, Lava is a very complicated system, kind of, a lot, some people think it's kind of like the Yocto project of, <laughs> of test system. You know, Yocto is considered kind of a complicated build system. Uh, and Lava is a complicated test system, uh, but they've done a lot of things to kind of um, make it more robust and uh, to make it a little bit easier to use. So the job files now use Digit2 te templates. Uh, previously, these were having JSON, uh, and it, it, they are trying to use kind of standard facilities. Uh, so they're using zero MQ for communications. Something called Reactobus uh, is to run jobs for messages, and um, you have to be a little bit more explicit in your board configuration. But uh, I've heard a lot of feedback that the changes in V2 were very well received by the Lava community. And some of the, a lot of people combine some of these. So Lava is really about test infrastructure, uh, and controlling boards and communicating with them, and scheduling jobs. Uh, Fuego is more about the actual tests themselves. And so, for instance, for the AGL project, uh, Automotive Grade Linux, they're actually using a combination of Fuego and Java, or and Lava, I mean, not Java, Lava. Uh, in their lab for doing their ADL testing. Uh, tool chains. So there actually has been some interesting stuff going on in tool, in the world of tool chains. LLVM 4.0 uh, was released. Uh, there's, and you can read about some of that stuff there. Um, and, and then uh, uh, there's a presentation about using uh, GCC and Clang optimizations uh, for embedded Linux. So, uh, there's lots of lots of optimizations, lots of work going on in the compiler space, and sometimes uh, we don't hear about it or use it for many years. So it's worth checking it out every once in a while to see if uh, there's something you could, that will add to your project. Okay, tracing. So I talked about perf tools. Uh, there's there's the uh, time history, uh, the sketch perf sketch time hist, which allows you to look at uh, scheduling events. Actually, time histogram. Sorry. And then C2C is cache line contention analysis. That's that's handy for finding uh, if you've got caching problems. Uh, and then 
let's see, there's a good talk on dynamic tracing tools on the ARM platform, great overview of the different tools that are available uh, at ELC. Um, Okay, now, finally, for some miscellaneous issues. These are issues that I couldn't fit really into any of the other categories. Um, some things that have just been discussed recently on the Kernel Summit discussion list or just in the industry, um, and I'll just go through each of these. So, print gate issues. So, there's been a lot of discussion on the Kernel Summit mailing list uh, about print K and whether we need to go back to the drawing board and, and change a bunch of things. I personally think uh, they should not mess with it. It's uh, it's already super complicated. They actually want to simplify it, make it for CPU, fix some things like the console lock being held too long. Uh, but it, it, it's used by so many things in the kernel, and there are a lot of very um, important requirements uh, that it satisfy. And so I think it's very it would be very very difficult uh, for them to replace it. Um, and satisfy all the use cases it currently has. Uh, just recently, I mean, like in the last week, uh, there was discussions about uh, this thing called turn continue. Uh, this is a flag that you put on the on the call uh, on print K call when you're doing you're splitting the lines among multiple print Ks to have them all appear on the same line. Well, it's never been reliable. Uh, it's basically unreliable for SMP kernels because if you're doing two calls to print K at different times, there's no guarantee that another process hasn't gotten in the middle and, and, uh, and output something. Um, but the latest kernel, and this was the controversial thing, now puts a slash N between lines that don't have current continue. So it actually, there's a, there's a chance that they'll get changed format of kernel messages uh, that people see from one version of the kernel to the next uh, without any source changes. So that is a that is, was very concerning to some people. Uh, they're talking about actually eventually removing kernel continue. Linus doesn't like it. Uh, he's saying that if you want lines to be joined, you're going to have to put them together yourself and try to call print k atomically for each individual line. That's really the way to go forward. Uh, so people have talked about different methods of doing that. There's something inside the kernel called uh, seekbuff uh, that does that, allows you to output serialized data atomically. Um, uh, anyway, so you can you can meet up on that. Another thing is, oh, year 2017 work. That's not right. It's year 2038 work. Uh, sorry, a typo in my presentation there. So uh, year 2038 is coming. I know it seems like a long ways off. It's 21 years away. Uh, but there are, there especially in the industrial, there are things that will get put into uh, industry or in infrastructure now that will probably be around 21 years from now. So our phones may not be, our laptops or our desktops may not be, but some cars might be, and definitely some bridges and some power plants might be. Um, and so we're actually very concerned that we get a lot of this work done as soon as possible, 2038. Um, so there's basically three main areas of work. A lot of this work is being done by a developer named Arne Bergman. He's converting all 32-bit timestamps to 64-bit in the kernel. Uh, one example of this is the new static system call that I talked about earlier. Uh, there's a lot of patches that are in progress for the file system layer, the video for Linux, the ice map or the input subsystem to uh, all use 64-bit timestamps. Uh, the C libraries, uh, once, you get, once you've got everything kind of done in the kernel, you have to work on the C library to make sure that uh, glibc uh, will be backwards compatible. So even programs built with 32-bit timestamps will work. <laughs> and then, once you get the C library done, you've got to work your way up to, to the programs and the packages. So there's distribution builds. Uh, there's going to be programs that, for one reason or another, are using odd things and, and uh, not not handling times correctly. Um, so uh, actually, a very good talk by Arne Bergman at uh, Lenaro Connect, uh, I think in March, on this topic. And you can read about that talk and go look at his slides. And, and I think the video is online as well. Uh, sorry, this is 2038 work, not 2017 work. And then issues with kconfig. Uh, so there's a discussion on the kernel summit mailing list about kconfig. Uh, kconfig is really, really core to building the kernel, configuring it. Uh, but a lot of, well, Linus in particular said it's way too hard for end users. Um, this may or may not apply to embedded developers because we're supposed to know everything that's in our hardware. 
but some of the things that were discussed with it is particularly if they change the K config system, that will have big, uh, big impact uh, throughout the whole Linux industry because <coughs> everyone will be affected by this. You can see his complaint, some of the things that he complains about uh, why K config is, is uh, has problems, what his issues are with it. Some of the ideas uh, really kind of boil down to doing um, doing K config differently. Uh, instead of doing it on a on an individual config by config basis, basically doing some higher level options or grouping of options to make it easier, and also doing better dependencies. Uh, the big problem is when there's a feature uh, that a, a config option that asks an end user about a feature, that's like control groups. You know, some feature of control groups. It's like, well, how is an end user supposed to know to turn that on? And this is true even in the embedded space. It's like, even if you're building with Yocto, you don't know which of your packages need control group features and what special features uh, are required. Uh, and so it'd be really good to make that so the, the system could deal with that for you. <clears throat> and then finally, uh, this kind of miscellaneous thing, AGL, Automotive Grade Linux. I was very excited. I was at uh, Open Source Summit Japan in June of this year, and uh, it was announced there that the first car in the U.S. Uh, with an ADL-based infotainment uh, unit will be uh, shipping in, uh, well, actually be shipping this fall in the U.S. The 2018 car year starts in 2017. That's, anyway, but the 2018 Toyota Camry is using an ADL-based uh, infotainment OS. And then I just saw today uh, that Mazda and Toyota are collaborating on that as well. So Mazda is getting, getting involved with that. So uh, AGL is really starting to take off and starting to appear in the first product in the industry. And so that's, uh, I think that's good. We'll see more and more Linux used in uh, automobiles. Um, okay. All right, that was a long, that was a long slog. I'll try to finish up here uh, relatively quickly. Uh, but uh, just go through a couple more areas here. Uh, I'll talk about the CD working projects and next. So we have a couple of projects and initiatives. We have the shared embedded distribution, uh, the LTSI, which is long-term stable initiative, Fuego and the Elance Wiki. Um, the shared embedded Linux distribution is uh, it's really a, an effort to try to combine Yocto and Debian, uh, and this has been uh, discussed, uh, presented at uh, numerous conferences, and uh, it actually exists now. There's a meta Debian layer. Uh, the goal here is to provide something uh, that leverages all of the benefits of Debian with their uh, long-term maintenance, and but the customizability uh, and kind of uh, embedded cross-build features of Yocto. Um, so that work is ongoing. Uh, and then the long-term support initiative is also, uh, this is actually uh, the LTSI project has been itself been going on for a long time. I think we hit five years. Um, but uh, the current LTSI kernel is 4.9. Uh, the work is in progress on the next release. Uh, we're in the testing phase right now. I think they have, uh, uh, I think, well, I just saw some stuff on the mailing list. A couple of more um, backports for uh, Reinfus are, are going in, I think, this week. Um, but anyway, you can uh, read more about that or, or look up that if you look at uh, Shabana San's presentation at ELC. And he's going to be talking again, I believe, in uh, ELC Europe uh, about that initiative. And then the Fuego Linux Taste Framework, I already kind of talked about that. Uh, there is a, a Birds of a Feather session with more information about the status and roadmap that you can look up. And there's, there's a wiki that you can see what we're doing. There's, uh, a lot of stuff going on with that. Uh, and I think later today, there is a presentation on GitLab in Fuego, right? So uh, that's very exciting. Uh, I may I may uh, call back in for that. Um, and then the Elinix Wiki. Uh, so this is, uh, this is essentially intended to be the Wikipedia of embedded Linux. Uh, tons and tons of information. Hundreds of pages of uh, material covering numerous topic areas, boot time, real time security, power management. Some of this stuff is kind of dated. It's not maintained a whole lot. Uh, but one area that is maintained and uh, is, very, uh, is very active is the slides and videos for all of the conferences. Uh, and so we have slides and videos for 12 years of the Mid-Atlantic Conference. Um, and I was just looking at some today. There are some 
it may sound like uh, something that's 12 years old is not that relevant, uh, but I was just looking at one today on uh, contributing to Mainline, and it had uh, it was by Greg Crow Hartman and Matt Makel and and Greg Unger, and it had all the same principles are still applicable today. So there's a lot of really really useful material there. Uh, basically on every topic. So you have to kind of use, they're not organized by topic, they're organized by year. Uh, but, if, but if you use Google, you can find a lot of great material uh, on this, on any topic you're interested in. USB, Bluetooth, real time, power management, system size, uh, lots and lots of, of material. So please use this site and uh, please also add to the site uh, if you find any information that you want to share with others. Um, Finally, just a few, few key other things. In terms of trade associations, there's two kind of big ones out there in the industry doing a lot of Linux work. Lenaro, um, uh, and I talked about some of the things they're doing a lot of V2 and Kernel CI, not to mention a whole bunch of driver and SOC work and infrastructure work. Uh, they're in the top 10 contributors to Linux kernel, uh, and uh, they're now promoting Zephyr as a non-Linux OS for their uh, lower end project. Uh, Lenaro Connect, which is their conference, consistently has very useful materials. That's another place to go look uh, if you want to find out information about something. The Linux Foundation is continuing to grow. Uh, it had its first event in China, uh, LinuxCon China, I believe. Uh, sold out in two weeks, had over 1,200 attendees. Uh, so it uh, seems like, you know, I know that there's a lot of people in China who have been doing Linux for a long time, but uh, it was, I, I happened to attend this conference, and it was really interesting to see the enthusiasm. Uh, and it uh, seems like a whole new market of developers uh, there to, to uh, get involved with Linux. Um, they have over 100 conferences, uh, 67 projects. Some of the projects are not even specific to Linux. Linux Foundation is kind of uh, becoming the general open source project, uh, umbrella company. Uh, management agency, what have you. They have more than 500 members, so uh, they're doing they're doing quite well. Um, conferences. So I like conferences. I like sharing information with people. Uh, ELC 2017. You saw that I had a lot of references, a lot of great presentations there on all kinds of topics. There was the Open Source Summit in Japan. Uh, it was held in June. Uh, Better Linux Conference Europe is coming up. Uh, in Prague in October, uh, so we're looking uh, forward to that one. Uh, the program is now online, and actually uh, there's a pretty good chance that it will sell out. Uh, we've already have got, um, well, for the combined events, we already have 800 people registered. Uh, so um, if you plan on going to that, uh, don't hesitate to get registered soon. Uh, and then Embedded Linux Conference 2018 is coming up uh, again in March next year in Portland, Oregon. And the Japan Jamborees, like this one, uh, are continuing and have good, uh, good content. So I just have a couple of closing thoughts. I'm going to talk about a Google search oddity and a little bit about how Linux is doing in Embedded. So, uh, and I want someone to try this uh, here. Uh, so if you search, if you do a Google search for the Linux kernel uh, and look at the icon that, that appears for Linux, it's kind of a goofy looking Tux. I don't know if you can see that very well, but Tux has some, I guess, teeth are hanging out on the side. I don't think people actually have teeth that look like that, and his eyes are askew. Um, I don't know what happened. So Google, I don't think Google even knows of this. I think they picked up the wrong icon from somewhere. They have automatic algorithms to kind of do this stuff. And I believe they're pulling this one from uh, the Linux Facebook page, uh, which is just some, well, it's not a random developer, but it's, anyway, a developer put a goofy picture up there, and now it's, it's actually showing up on the logo on search terms on, the, on Google, which is kind of funny. Um, but anyway, I, I want some. I don't know if this, if, if you see this, if you do this from Japan. I this I did this just today, and this is what showed up. I was amazed that it would have a, a goofy looking icon. Uh, so someone do that and tell me if, if it shows up goofy in Japan. Um, this is, uh, but there's also just talking about Linux and uh, how it's doing. If you, this is from a survey that was done by Aspen Core. Uh, I believe it was done in April of this year talking about different OS's. It's a really interesting survey. It's worth taking a look at uh, in a lot of areas. It's uh, 
think it's sponsored by ED Times. But you see that Embedded Linux is the uh, number one operating system that people are currently using. Uh, but that this graph is actually deceiving. This is not this is not really correct because if you look, uh, they've got Android, which is Linux based, Debian, which is Linux, Ubuntu, which is both Debian and Linux, and then you can go down the down the line, and the second one from the bottom is Angstrom Linux. So they've actually broken Linux out into several categories. Um, if you actually add those all up, which I don't think you can do because you people may, I think we're allowed to respond to more than one thing. But if you add them all up, it's more like 61%. Um, so Linux is doing incredibly well. Uh, there's no question that Linux is, is the dominant OS and embedded. Um, and uh, you can read more about the survey and actually go get the survey. It's a very extensive survey. It's very, really worth taking a look at uh, if you go to this link here. Um, but so Linux is doing really, really good. Despite that goofy text that, that Google is showing everybody, world domination is proceeding as planned. And uh, so with that, I will uh, just say, uh, I just want to point you to some resources. Uh, this is where I get most of my information from. You probably saw an awful lot of links to LWN.net. Uh, if you're not subscribed to that, please do so. Even if you don't feel like you want a subscription, uh, it's worth it to, to give some money to um, uh, the group of people that run LWN.net. They provide an invaluable service uh, to the industry. So even if you don't contribute code to the Linux kernel, if you buy an LWN.net subscription, uh, you, that could be your way of uh, helping to advance the cause of Linux. Uh, uh, John Corbett, who's the, who's the main editor there, is actually the one who does the kernel documentation. So you're really helping to, and then the articles that get written there actually become kernel documentation over time. So you're helping support Linux. Kernel Newbies, kernel Newbies has some really good information if you're just getting into Linux, and it also has uh, some pages dedicated to describing the features in various releases, the Linux Wiki, and the C Linux Dev Manifest. So uh, with that, I thank you very much for your time, and I'm willing to answer any questions that you have. Thank you very much, Tim. Um, I'd like to add one information about LLVM. LLVM projects are going to change the license policy. They, are, uh, they have been using the uh, uh, BSD license for the LLVM, including that runtime. But maybe uh, quite shortly they will change that kind of license to the Apache version 2, including the uh, uh, runtime library, which goes in oh. the in the you know uh, mailing list of uh, our LLVM. And of course, if they choose the uh, Apache license for the runtime library, uh, it may cause some of the problem of the comp compatibility with their GPL or LGPL. But they are considering to add some of the additional you know, term uh, in conjunction with the Apache version 2 for the uh, runtime library, and they will be able to uh, successfully avoid the compatibility problem with the GPL license. But unfor unfortunately, I have not yet uh, updated the latest situation of the LLVM, so that stay tuned to the LLVM uh, community uh, mailing list. Um, uh, that is not the finalized uh, uh, information which I obtained, but uh, Actually, the, uh, in the mailing list of the LLVM, they are, they are making that kind of discussion. This, this is additional of my uh, what I, I have. Do you have some information about LLVM? Uh, no, I hadn't heard that. So that's, that's quite interesting. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I will, uh, I will try to pay attention to that. Yeah, that's interesting. So, any, any kind of uh, discussion of the question to Tim or uh, share uh, together with us? So, Tim, I have two questions. One is, uh, would you, uh, do you, are you going to make an additional report about the uh, solar eclipse? Oh, yes, I should. <laughs> so, uh, this has nothing to do with Linux. Uh, I'm going to talk uh, I went to the solar eclipse in the United States. So uh, my sister lives in Idaho Falls, Idaho, uh, which is just a short 16-hour drive away. Uh, so I went up and visited my sister, and her house actually was in the path of totality. So I went and stayed with her for a couple of days. My family took a trip. And uh, I got to say, you know, I had, I had been planning the trip for quite a while, 
And uh, I had a friend that was really, really um, excited about it and had been to an eclipse before. And he said, oh, you got to go see it. You got to go see it in the path of totality. And uh, I got to say, I was not disappointed. I was very, very excited uh, to see the total eclipse. It is not, it is uh, about 10,000% better than a partial eclipse. <laughs> it is so interesting and uh, just, uh, it just really feel, uh, fills you with a sense of, uh, I don't know, just wonder and awe uh, because of the stuff that happens. I mean, you kind of know what's going on because you know all the science behind it. Basically, you're just in the moon's shadow. Uh, but some of the stuff that happens, you just it, uh, I tried to tried to see if I could figure out what was it about the eclipse that was so that was so kind of moving. And uh, the only thing I can think of was that you just don't see phenomena on that scale in your normal everyday life. I mean, if you go to a, a big canyon, you can see this thing that's like super super huge, and and just you know you just go wow. And I think the eclipse is like that. Is when you see it, you know. It's, in, in one sense, it's just a little thing that happens in the sky, but but not in the, not in the path of totality. The entire area got dark. The stars came out. The street lights came on. Uh, there were all kinds of interesting phenomena. There were something called shadow bands that we were able to see right before the eclipse. The light gets really really weird. Uh, the corona comes out, and when you look up at it, it just makes you go wow. So sorry for talking so long, but I was really, really excited. I uh, had a really great time seeing the eclipse. Highly recommend if uh, if you ever have a chance to go see a total eclipse. They're kind of rare, so it's hard to get to them. And yeah. a lot of times you have to travel, but uh, yeah. well in, worth it. In suburb of Tokyo, we will have that kind of chance in the uh, 2035, uh, September 2nd. Well, and there you go. So yeah. 2035, put it on your calendars. Sure. And another question is that, uh, have you placed the order to the Toyota dealer for the Camry 2018 model? <laughs> and I'm curious about the GPL license term, along with that kind of thing. Well, so, so this is kind of funny. I actually, uh, so AGL, okay, so uh, no, I'm, I'm not going to purchase a Toyota Camry. Here's the thing, I already, I already own a Toyota Camry <laughs> and, and a Toyota Highlander. And the Highlander we got, bought just last year, that's their SUV. And uh, I actually looked, the infotainment system in our Highlander has a GPL thing on it. So it's okay. already Linux based, but it was not AGL. Sure. Uh, so I, I think it, the system was produced by Panasonic. Anyway, so yeah, so I did look for the GPL uh, information in my infotainment system on my Toyota car already and, uh, and found it. So they're doing, uh, I guess, they're doing, I didn't actually go download the code, so I, you know, <laughs> okay. I think they're compliant, but anyway. <laughs> anyway, thank you very much. Uh, any, any other questions or some of the discussion or talk? Uh, hi, team. Uh, this is Fukuchi. Oh, okay. Uh, I, I want to know about uh, memory size of Linux. Uh, you reported it every time you reported the reaction of uh, memory size of Linux, and uh, but uh, I'm not familiar with uh, Linux technology. So uh, if you can next time uh, to show us the uh, lin uh, for example, uh, increasing the graph of uh, Linux memory size or. Uh, uh, you mean the minimum required memory yeah. size to run yeah. the new Linux, uh, yeah. uh, along with the uh, versions? Yes. Tim, is, okay. it, is it possible to make a such kind of reporting of the uh, memory size growth required for the minimum? minimum? Yeah, for a long time, uh, Matt Mako had a chart like that. Uh, when he was a Linux Tiny maintainer, he had a chart. Uh, he ran some automated tests, kind of continuous integration that would show uh, kind of the minimum size for a, a minimally configured uh, kernel. And it, it did kind of steadily creep up. I don't think he's still running that, but uh, I can certainly see uh, see about generating something like that. In fact, that would be a good project to add to Fuego. <laughs> it would be a continuous integration memory size test. Uh -huh. um, 
so yeah, actually, that that would be that would be something fun to do. Actually, see if I can get something. Uh, it is it's gotten pretty big. Uh, the the hard thing is that um, you have to be really really aggressive about reducing things to get the lowest possible footprint, um, and so. And, it's really hard to compare between different products because different products will configure different things on and off, right? If you have networking on, that's one of the biggest things. Um, and in fact, the minute that, that is another thing with doing the automated test is uh, usually uh, these are systems where you uh, don't have the normal ways of interacting with the board uh, because you've got networking turned off, you've got networking in a very minimal configuration, and so you have to resort to serial console and some other things. Um, to get the data from from the system. Anyway, so yeah, that's something I can try. Uh, thank you. And uh, one one more uh, uh, question. Uh, uh, you you mentioned uh, uh, some code hardening. Code hardening. Uh, yeah. Uh, what what does it mean? Uh, the the hardening means uh, like in a uh, a long code, is, is that correct? Uh, kernel, kernel hardening means mm. uh, to make the kernel harder to attack security-wise. Mm. Oh, so so uh, it's a, there's a whole project uh, that involves uh, looking at, so every, every year there's a number of uh, what are called exploits, which are techniques that are discovered by which someone can uh, can break into the kernel, uh, cause malicious code to be executed, or take change their privileges from regular user to a root user, and then they can take over the system that way. So, and there's probably um, oh I don't know off the top of my head probably a hundred or so vulnerabilities that are published each year. Well, some of the what's happened is uh, people are looking at the patterns and they're trying to say okay well. You know, these 10 vulnerabilities are all because of a buffer overflow situation. So is there something we could do to fight all buffer overflows? Instead of just closing each one individually, you know, like this is a buffer flow in the networking over code, or this is a buffer overflow in uh, the file system code. So what people have been doing, which is a different approach just in the last couple of years, is uh, they've been trying to come up with general techniques for closing these exploits. Uh, so they'll come up with something that closes off all buffer overflows, or in the case, a lot of a lot of uh, security problems are caused by stack overflows. So one of the things I mentioned was uh, that there's now a way to make it much harder uh, for people to corrupt the kernel stack, um, and so that's that's what kernel hardening is: is making it more uh, secure, more difficult for, and basically more hard. For kernel for attackers to uh, break into the kernel. I see. Uh, thank you very much. I got it. Yep. Anyone? Any other questions or uh, some discussion? Okay. Uh, hello, Tim. Uh, regarding uh, Linux co uh, contribution, Linux code contribution. Uh, as a beginner, uh, usually what you tend to do is you go to Linux next tree and you try to fix some uh, code style fixes and all. So that's how you get in, right? Uh, if I'm not wrong. Well, that, that is one way. Uh, you have to be careful with that. Um, some people will just go in and fix, um, fix something like uh, white space uh -huh. uh, or, or something that is really uh, trivial. And the maintainers in general, if, it, if it's too trivial, they don't, they don't like that mm -hmm. um, because they'd much rather be looking at uh, things that are real changes. But I think the best uh, type of thing to work on first is some bug that you found. Okay. Uh, it doesn't have to be a bug that you found, but even just a bug that's been reported. Okay. Uh, and uh, that type of thing is is uh, is really really well received, and a lot of these bug fixes are very very short patches. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of bug fixes are just one or two lines. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's like something like a buffer was not freed or was used after it was freed or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, 
And so the patches themselves are not difficult. Um, well, finding them, finding the bug, and diagnosing it and fixing uh, it, well, finding the bug is really difficult, but fixing it turns out to be really easy. Um, <clears throat> but that, those types of patches are very, very well received. Okay. And then, well, yeah. Some, yeah. One of the biggest mistakes I see people doing for first-time contributors is uh, is when they're doing driver development, they'll develop the entire driver before they send it to mainline. Okay. And it doesn't give the, uh, the community the opportunity to look at it and, and kind of uh, help uh, correct yeah, you, uh, you should market. get it reviewed before you like start the whole one. Yeah, you get it reviewed. Yeah. <clears throat> even even if it's just uh, well, yeah, even if you're just floating the idea out there. But even better is to just send some code and say, look, this doesn't work, but this is how I'm planning on doing it. Mm -hmm. The interfaces I'm planning on using, because a lot of times kernel developers will be able to tell you, oh, if you do it this other way, you know, there's already a subsystem that handles you know like an allocator for you, so you don't you can take all this code out and you don't have to do that. Uh, most code, there's been some interesting stats done. Um, most code, when it is converted from a driver that's outside the kernel to a driver that's inside the kernel, mm -hmm. uh, drops to about 20% of its former size. Mm -hmm. uh, so a lot of drivers that are that are like migrated from like Windows device drivers and turned into Linux device drivers, uh, the code size goes uh, drops dropped to 20% of what it was before. Uh, because there's so many facilities in the Linux kernel for handling things. Mm -hmm. yeah, thank you. Okay, it must be a quite important and good question. Um, Tim Wood is quite happy to make a consultation or as help to make your successful apps, uh, you know, uh, donation of the code into the uh, main line so that uh, please do not make any hesitation to communicate with him. It's not only the uh, issue for Sony internal issue, but uh, out of Sony people, uh, you may contact to uh, Team World to ask what is the uh, required to make up streaming of your patches, and we are quite quite happy to make such kind of contribution to you guys. Yeah, I'm happy to help uh, people formatting or syntax or who to, who to talk to, how to talk to them. Uh, type of issues. I won't know all of the technical details. I, I'm not like a video expert or a networking expert, uh, but uh, I can certainly help you with the logistics, and I'm happy to do it. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions or discussions? A proposal to team to buy the camera. No, <laughs> no way. Anyway, thank you very much, team, and have a good evening. Okay. Yes. Thank you.